how much you thank you. One question is how much you can tell about dynamics from the action on homotopy and homology. The other question, which is related to that, is how do we understand when dynamics is persistent under homotopy? So the strategy for the talk is we're going to have a model map with well understood dynamics. So its starting point, which I had last time, was pi one hyperbolicity. So that meant in the covering space, things were expanding uniformly, or if it was hyper, if it was homeomorphism, expanding and contracting. So from the definition of Nielsen class, that means that we can only fix a single, at most a single point by a lift. So that means that all the periodic points of all iterates are in different Nielsen classes, all right? It also means they're all uncollapsible, meaning there's no period dividing bifurcations. All right, so this is feeding into the fundamental theorem of Nielsen theory, which is if you have with additional hypothesis here that their indices are non-zero, that if you have Nielsen classes that are uncollapsible and essential, then they all persist under homotopy. So we had many examples. The um, what examples of these are Anasov's on Tori these maps on the wedge and um, pseudo anosovs which Toby talked about, which inspired a lot of this. Now, I, the next stage is to go one stage further and not just have periodic points persist, but all the dynamics persist, all right? And that's where global shadowing comes in. So I didn't, oops, need to probably activate it here. We need to um, have a way, have an idea that generalizes Nielsen equivalence to non-periodic points. All right, so let's be, I saw this already. Let me talk about the um, definition, remind you the definition in the cover. So we pass ourselves to, in this case, the universal cover, and we have two homotopic maps and we say that orbits globally shadow if they stay a bounded distance away in the covering space. All right, so we can ignore that. So that's global shadowing. It, it relates the, any pair of orbits from any two homotopic maps. Okay, so to get these nice global persistence results, we need what I had already. We need the expansion and the essentialness that allows the periodic orbits to persist, but somehow we have to take that and jack it up to get all the orbits persisting. So for that, we need the periodic orbits are dense, all right? So that's the additional hypotheses that we're gonna require, but it's still gonna be satisfied by our examples, pseudo Anasovs, linear Anasovs, et cetera. Okay, so we did this last time. This is the definition of the expansion in the cover, that we have an equivariant metric in the cover, that distances are uniformly expanded. So this is what it means to be pi one hyperbolic. And all our examples on the wedge of two circles, here's one of them, lambda was four, lambda was four and five in our other examples. I hope you remember those, we'll come back to them. You got linear expanding maps on tori. Um, if you have a homeomorphism, then you have to control both forward time and backwards time. And for that, you need a pair of pseudometrics, which we'll see those, they come from the foliations in the pseudo Anasov case. All right, so you expand in one direction and you contract in the other, or you expand in backwards time. So to make these arguments work, it's always the expansion that, that runs the engine. So you think of the expansion in backwards time. All right, so this is um, getting uh, the hypothesis on the action in the cover. Um, and this is the re remark I've made already, that if you have this kind of expansion, you have different um, 
all the periodic points are in different Nielsen classes. Let me ignore this. This is, we've kind of went through this already. So here's our hypotheses. So as I said already at the very beginning, we want hyperbolicity. So we want expansion in the cover, right? Which is because the cover is intimately connected with the fundamental group. This is actually algebraically some kind of expansion in the action on pi one, but I'm kind of not telling you about that bit of it because the title is topology forces dynamics. So we have this expansion in the cover. We have dense periodic points. That was the new hypothesis. And the periodic points all have non-zero index. So these guys are called H1 and H2. All right, so this we talked about already. So here's our main theorem. Um, so let's say we satisfy these hypotheses, these three things, expansion in the cover, non-zero index, and periodic points dense. And you perturb such a map. You perturb one of these examples I keep, I've talked about. Then under that perturbation, the dynamics is persisted, persistent, all right? Now it persists in the terms of not a full semi-conjugacy, but a semi-conjugacy restricted to some compact invariant set, all right? So the theorem says there's a compact invariant set Y continuous on to alpha homotopic to the inclusion with this guy uh, commuting. All right, so in short, even though you perturb one of these maps arbitrarily much, as long as you stay in the same homotopy class, your dynamics all persist. All right, in particular, your entropy can only go up, it can't go down because this guy is sitting inside. Now I was asked last time, oops. So anyway, there's, there's examples first before I make that comment. So all of our examples thus far, phi one, phi two, phi three, they were all pi one hyperbolic because there was no cancellation in the action on pi one. Periodic orbits were dense. They all had non-zero index and thus our theorem holds. So any of these maps, you isotope, you homotope them as much as you want. Your original dynamics don't go away. And as we'll see, pseudo Anasov maps will also satisfy this theorem. And as I think I've said several times, the real inspiration for this theorem is pseudo Nasov maps. Okay, so let me just tell you about the proof because it illuminates the next step here. So the important thing is that what's this magic set Y and what does it have to do with global shadowing? Well, Remember, we have two maps. We have phi, that's our very friendly map that has all these nice properties. And this G is just some perturbation of it. So the set Y is all the Ys that have some X that they shadow, all right? So X has all these orbits and we include Y in capital Y if it shadows one of them. So it's all the friends of the well-behaved orbit. All right, and this is the set we have to work with. And then we prove a bunch of stuff about it, that it's closed. This is all in the covering space now, remember. It's closed. We can push it downstairs. It's invariant upstairs. We push it downstairs. It's invariant. The map, which sends a point to its buddy, it sends a point of Y to the point of X and globally shadows. You yeah, show that's well-defined and continuous and then you push the whole thing down. All right, so now what have we used thus far? We only use, in fact, for this, the pi one hyperbolicity. Now the last step is where we use the dense periodic orbits and the non-zero index, because we know that by, by the Nielsen theory that I did last time, the periodic orbits persist. And by the lemma, which I said last time, your Nielsen equivalent, if and only if you globally shadow. So sitting up in here are our points, our periodic points that correspond to the dense collection of periodic points down here. All right, now that tells me that the image of Y is a dense set down here because you know they, they all shadow some point down here. Alpha is continuous, this is compact. 
they're dense down there, so the image must be everything, right? The image includes a dense set. The image is a compact set that includes a dense set and therefore must be everything. Okay, so that's the proof. Now the heart of the, well, the part of the matter is proving all these things. All right, but that's, you know, the important thing for your our conceptual understanding is what this set Y is. All right, so here, terribly different font. I made it last night. Um, so remember, why is this set that globally shadows an orbit of phi? So in particular, if G has a point that does not globally shadow, then Y is a proper subset, right? So you don't get a sub, you know, as I keep saying, you don't get all the dynamics of G sent down to that of phi. So the easiest example to think about is in the map G, you create a new Nielsen class. Remember what our Nielsen classes are. You create a new Nielsen class, and a Nielsen class that's new can't shadow one for phi because if it did, it well, it can't be Nielsen equivalent because that means it would globally shadow. That would mean it was Nielsen equivalent, which it can't be because you've assumed it's new. So in most situations, well, there's theorems about this. This Y is actually a proper subset. So G can have a bunch of new stuff happening. Okay, so this is this is all the proof. This all this stuff is online. If you want to have a look at it. Um, and now let me talk about applications. Okay, so now we have a theorem that tells about persistence of dynamics. And as you might guess, the strategy is, as Toby kind of obliquely referred to, pseudo Anasov maps or other maps have a Markov partition. So we can understand their dynamics. So if we understand their dynamics, then this theory tells us no matter how we push them, we still have that dynamics. So it actually usually goes the other way. You're handed a map and you say, ah, this is connected to a pseudo Anasov map. Let's find out what the pseudo Anasov map is, understand its dynamics, and then we know about the original system that wasn't pseudo Anasov. All right, so Toby told you about um, pseudo Anasov maps. They're a generalization of linear Anasov maps. Um, they have a pair of transverse invariant foliations. The difference is you don't use the derivative for hyperbolicity, you use a measure on transverse arcs. All right, so you have a pair of measures on transverse arcs, and they, those measures expand and contract. And Toby told you about measured foliations. Um, you have singularities because you're on other surfaces. Um, the transverse measure is holonomy invariant. These can, one can slide to the other. Um, so the definition of pseudo Anasov is you have a pair of transverse invariant foliations, a number of lambda, which is this number lambda I keep referring to, we, we need for expansion in the cover, such that the stable guy is contracted, the unstable guy is expanded, and these are just pictures. All right, so it, again, it looks, as Toby said, it looks like a linear Nossoff, but you have singularities. All right, so it has, as with a linear Nossoff, it has all the nice dynamical properties. Remember, the strategy here is to have a, mini, have a nice map and perturb it. So the pseudo Nossoffs have all these wonderful properties we know and love. Uh, you have a Markov partition, dense periodic orbits, which we're going to need. The, you have a pair of transverse measures. You can take their product and get an invariant measure, uh, which is ergodic under the pseudo Nossoff. The topological entropy is log lambda, not surprising because you're stretching and contracting by, by a factor of lambda. Periodic orbits points all have non-zero index. That's what we're going to need. Well, we need that for our persistence theorem. And it's also pi one hyperbolic. All right, so let me briefly explain how you get the pi one hyperbolic here. So if I draw a picture, where is the, uh, there it is. Just briefly, so you see how the hyperbolicity works in this particular case, is you lift the, well, let's just do the simple, you lift the foliations and you have some transverse arc like this, 
And you know, in one direction it expands, and then in the other direction it contracts. So you use the transverse measure to give yourself a metric. You have a pair of points here, then you go from there to there, and then you take the infimum over the place in the usual way. And then because of the expansion and contraction of the measures, you get expansion and contraction of these pseudometrics. They're pseudometrics because if you're on the same leaf, you have distance zero. And then the thing that really makes this work is that you have to prove this, but often to cover each leaf can intersect, a, a stable leaf can intersect an unstable leaf at at most one point. So that gives the fact that this guy put together is actually a metric. And so here we get pi one hyperbolicity. So now we have all the ingredients for the theorem that I stated, but didn't prove. So this is just restating the theorem for this particular case. We have, uh, now we're working in the world of homeomorphisms. We're isotopic to a pseudo anosov. There's a continuous onto map. Um, and there's this set Y, which is a compact invariant. And so in particular, if you're isotopic, to a pseudo anosov you have not less entropy and you have all its dynamics. All right, so I've already talked about Nielsen theory. All right, so this again, as I said, this is the original context of this kind of global persistence theorem that I've been speaking of. All right, so just about measures, um, because we have this semi-conjugacy, then the measures here lift the ergodic measures up here. So we not only get kind of topological dynamics, but you get some ergodic theory dynamics too. And this is just a uniqueness statement that if you're isotopic to a pseudo anosov, then you're conjugate, right? So that's just saying some uniqueness about them. All right, so as I told you, the strategy is to understand the, the model dynamics, which in this case are pseudo anosov understand the Markov partition, and say the dynamics are preserved. So how do you find that Markov partition? All right, so there's various algorithms, but the one that works all the time is, is due to Besfina and Handel. Um, you could implement it on a computer. Um, Toby has an implementation. It'll give you, you give it the action on pi one, it'll tell you the Markov partition. Um, and so this tells us that our strategy can um, succeed. You know, you, you, there are other tricks here. You don't have to always just get the Markov partition. There are other tricks to understand its dynamics. Now, all this would be kind of silly if there were very few pseudo Anosov maps. But as Toby alluded to, they're basically the typical isotopy class contains a pseudo Anosov map. So here's the class, oops. So I'm going to tell you the classification theorem, but I need to have pseudo Anosovs on boundary. So you make it you make it look on the boundary like just blowing up as if it was smooth. So that's kind of the obvious thing to do. And then here's the classification theorem that we've already seen that if you're a homeomorphism of a compact surface, you're either pseudo Anosov, finite order, or you're reducible, which is to say, here's just a picture, you cut it into pieces, all right? And for example, here you do an order two flip, and here it's a NASA, all right? So any isotopy class, so as I, this is like a prime decomposition theorem, right? So these are the prime numbers, and these are the composite numbers. Okay, so how do you decide an isotopy class is pseudo Anosov and run this um, strategy? Well, there's lots of results about algebraic and geometric, and I'm gonna show, tell you some of them in a special case. Okay, so now if you're a dynamicist, and even if you work on manifolds, you typically are gonna work with a map that's isotopic to the identity. Right, it's like time one map of a flow, time one map of a force, something or other, kind of the usual first context, you know, for a, for a manifold dynamics is isotopic to the identity, 
And all these pseudo Nassovs are definitely not isotopic to the identity, right? So it seems like it's gonna not be very much use to you. But there's an idea due to the Rufus Bowen, um, which is works in surfaces because of points are co-dimension two. But here's his idea. You have a periodic orbit. And well, in the map, the isotopy class is isotopic to the identity. But if you pull out the periodic orbit, you get a new isotopy class on the complement of the periodic orbit. And that very well may not be isotopic to the identity, right? If you remember back last lecture, I showed you a picture of fluid stirring. And when the fluid stirring was going on, the isotopy class on the complement of the stirrers was pseudo-anosov, right? But of course, if you fill the stirrers in, then everything is isotopic to the identity because orientation preserving homeomorphism in the disk are all isotopic to the identity. Okay, so this is the strategy, Bowen's strategy. We pull out periodic points and look at the map on the complement. Okay, so there's some technicalities here because, well, the issue is if we pull out the points, it's non-compact, right? So we wanna leave the points in. So we talk about being pseudo Nassau relative to a finite set. So the new feature is you allow one prongs at the periodic points, all right? And then you have a new language. You have to speak in terms of isotopy classes relative to this orbit, or if you like on the, punctured by the orbit space. And you speak of an isotopy class being finite order reducible or pseudo relative to a finite set. All right, so we're implementing um, Bowen's program, but we're leaving the points in and just thinking of things relative to those points. So any isotopy has to fix those points. Right now, there's some technicalities here that I'm avoiding to make this whole thing run. And here's some of the technicalities, which I'm going to skip, but the moral of the story is Handel's theorem works, right? So we still get this isotopy stability of all possible pseudo-Nasov dynamics. Okay, so here I've said this in um, without a slide, but here's, here's the strategy now. Here's the strategy now for using Thurst this theorem of Thurston. And all we've learned about isotopy stability of dynamics to put it in use to understand, you know, your generic dynamical system. So let's start with a map on a surface isotopic to the identity. We pick ourselves a finite invariant set, usually a collection of periodic orbits, right? And we're gonna, we wanna understand What's the implication of just having that periodic orbit? All right, that's how the theorems go. Then we say, okay, we have this periodic orbit. Let's run this program due to Bowen. First, the way you usually do this in practice is you, you have a periodic orbit, which implies the class is irreducible. I'll show you an example in a minute. And then you show that class can't be finite order, and therefore it has to be pseudo -nosal. All right, so now you have a pseudo Nossoff class, you compute some properties of it. And then here's the kicker, the dynamics must be present in G, all right? So you given this G, you have this finite invariant set and you do this whole machine pseudo Nossoff, then you come back to G and you get to say by Handel's persistence theorem, this dynamics is actually there in G, all right? For example, the entropy. You get a pseudo Nassoff map, it has some entropy bounds and entropy, and then G must have at least that entropy just because it has that periodic orbit. All right, so here's some examples um, of implementing this strategy in kind of the simplest case. So let's look at a homeomorphism of the disk. And let's say it has, it's isotopic to the identity. It has a periodic orbit of period Q, which is a prime number. All right, so prime number is important here. And then the result first, as I said, first you show the class is irreducible. All right, well, this is actually quite easy. How do you show 
how do you see that it's irreducible? Well, you assume it's reducible. So what does it mean reducible? It means that there's a, there's a multi-curve, there's a collection of invariant curves that you can cut along, and these invariant curves are invariant. Sorry, these invariant curves are, are the Department of Redundancy Department. So the invariant curves, <laughs> the curves are an invariant set, all right? So each one of them contains some number of points from the orbit, all right, say K, right? But they're invariant and they do everything. So K has to divide Q, right? It's a prime number, that's the whole point. So K has to be one or Q, that means that your gamma must be boundary parallel or they must be outer boundary parallel. They must be puncture parallel. But your reducing curves aren't allowed to do that because it's kind of trivial. All right, so it's irreducible basically by a simple argument. All right, so now we implement the second part. Is it finite order? Well, now we go back to a classic theorem, which I don't quite know the history, but three people seem to have proved it. Um, so there must have been mistakes along the way or else rivalries or people were in different countries. I don't know what the story is. But their theorem on the disk and the annulus says that if your finite order, if some iterate is the identity, then you are conjugate to rigid rotation, right? So the only finite order maps up to conjugacy are rigid rotation, all right? So that means, what do we have to do to get that relative to this orbit, it's, it's pseudo Anasov, we have to show it's not finite order. But finite order is very special, right? It just looks like this up to, up to conjugacy. So you have very, there's various schemes for deciding it's not finite order, right? You find an arc which relative to the orbit comes back to itself wrapped around somehow. Another way going back to Last uh, Tuesday's lecture, if you look at the braid, the braid of a finite order thing rotates. You can tell this guy is clearly not region rotation. And so it must be pseudo Anasov because three is a prime number. All right. So this um, tells you this gives a topological method of proving positive entropy. Right. You have a map of the disk. You just find a periodic or prime period, you run this game, you get an and then you compute the entropy of the pseudo Anasov, and that gives a lower bound for the entropy of your original map. All right, so that's the strategy. And then, as you can imagine, when you have a tool like this, you run with it. So there are many, many theorems out there which implement various aspects and consequences of this strategy. And let me talk about Another one, maybe I'll just say this one without going through the proof. So let's look on the annulus. Um, it's really the same proof, I'm just showing you another case. You look on the annulus, this just because of the theorem later. You look on the annulus and you have a period, you have a periodic orbit with rotation number P over Q. And P and Q are relatively prime, and Q is the period. All right. And then once again, so there's an easy argument. You just show it's irreducible. You couldn't have a reducing family. And again, by the finite order theorem, the only non pseudo Anasov orbit is one that looks like rigid rotation of the topology. All right. So another strategy is you just look at a, peri a periodic orbit in the annulus. You say, ah, I know because of its structure that it's not finite order. It's therefore pseudo Anasov. And then I get other information, for example, about rotation sets, which I'll tell you about um, in the second half here. So there's a special case here. There's something called a monotone twist map of the annulus. So in that case, to be finite order is the same as being ordered around the annulus like rigid rotation. So for a monotone twist map, if you have a PQ periodic orbit, if it's what's called a non burkhoff order orbit, it's not ordered properly around the circle, then it's pseudo Anasov and it implies entropy bounds and rotation set bounds and other such things. 
Okay, so let's see what I have 10 minutes to get through the first. Trying to, okay. So it's a little awkward to keep saying the isotopic class relative to this orbit and then saying if this orbit is like this. So there's a language, a notation or terminology to kind of compact all that into just one structure. And that structure is called a braid type. So let's say you have two different maps. Um, let me draw the picture again here. Let's say you have two different maps and let's be in the disk just to keep life simple. So we have two different maps and they both have a period three orbit. We want to say that up to the theory we're developing this isotopy classes on the complement that they're the same. So how are we going to say that? Well, we need a map here, right? The map should be on the complement of the orbits. All right, so that's this part. And it's much too strong to say it commutes. But what we want is a theory up to isotopy classes. So we require that this guy commutes up to isotope, all right? Which is saying that the isotopy class on the complement here and the complement here are the same, right? Up to conjugacy, but that doesn't really matter, okay? So they're the same. So that's the equivalence relation on the orbit. You say they're braid, they have the same braid type. And then what a braid type is, is an equivalence class of this relation. So it basically, informally, a braid type is just telling you some coordinate way free of thinking about the isotopy class on the continent. Okay, so the point here, then, then for a given map, we collect together all its braid types. All right, so it's like a rotation set, if you know a rotation set, but now we're collecting together all the data about all the isotopy classes on the complement of all the periodic orbits. And the point for the Thurston theory that we are using here and for isotopy stability of dynamics, um, if you have the same braid type, then the braid type, you can talk about the isotopy type, you can talk about the Thurston type of a braid type, because if you have the same braid type, then the complement on the complement of the two orbits, it's conjugate up to isotopy. So the Thurston representative pseudo Nassau finite order, whatever, will be the same. So the case we really care about is pseudo Nassau. All right, so now we want to use this language to formulate our theorems in a little more elegant fashion. Um, so we can, for example, define the topological entropy of a braid type, right? So because, and what that is, is the topological entropy of the Thurston representative of the pseudo Nassau representative, all right? So that makes perfect sense because if we change the, uh, the periodic orbit, the isotopy class and the complement is still conjugate. So it's the same Thurston type, it's the same minimal entropy. All right, so we can, for example, as our first invariant, we define the topological entropy of a braid type. All right, so then, again, I'm just saying things I've said before in a little eloquent language, a more eloquent language, that if you if a given map has a, if a given map contains a certain braid type, then I already given the argument, its entropy is bigger than the entropy of the braid type, right? And this is because we saw already from the conjugacy theorem, the pseudo Nassau entropy is a lower bound on the entropy in its isotopy class, all right? So this is, I said this program before, you can understand and in fact, just getting back <laughs> to a previous, that because of the theorem of Katak, so you might say, can you cap just because of what we've talked about already in these sessions, can you capture all the entropy? So if it's C1, then you use the theorem of Katak to get horseshoes, then in the horseshoes, you pull out periodic points. So in fact, you can find, you can arbitrarily closely approximate the entropy of F if it's C1 plus alpha 
by entropies of braid types. Okay, and again, using you know theorem, deep theorem of Kapok in the background. Okay, so now I'm going to go back and talk about the previous examples with this language, and then give you some newer ones. So remember, we let's look at the braid type of rigid rotation. That's the finite order one. All right, so. So this just says what we said before. If we have a braid type in the disk, a prime period, and it's not this one, then it's pseudo-Nossoff and it has positive entropy, right? So there's just one PQ braid type, PQ relatively prime with zero entropy. If it's not that, which we can tell by various combinatorial means, then you have positive entropy. And in fact, if you go more deeply, you can get an explicit estimate on the entropy. Same thing, um, if you have an annulus braid type of period Q, rotation P over Q, and it's not rigid rotation, then it's pseudo nasa all right? So again, you have any map of the annulus, you look at a periodic orbit, you run the program. This is important in torus rotation sets. If you have, so the rotation set, well, actually this tells you stuff about the rotation set. If you have three, three points with three rotation vectors, so in the torus you have a rotation vector, how much you're moving around the two generators. Um, and if you have three points with non-collinear, so the rotation vectors are points in the plane because you have two generators. You have non-collinear non -collinear, non ones, then that gray type is pseudo nasa all right, and this again, I'll talk about this maybe the next next half of the lecture. This is vital to understanding rotation sets. Let me skip this example. So here's, let me go on to another example. So period three orbits in the disk are particularly easy to understand for a number of different reasons. Um, and, so periodic points are even period three. So I've, I've done this already without being very formal, I'm not gonna be formal here, but they're a generator of the, of the group of isotopy classes, which is the same as the bracer. It's generated by rotating these guys and rotating these guys. So here's two generators. So you can just think of it as concretely as flipping these two, flipping these two. So any period three orbit, oops, so any period three orbit can be written as a word in these guys, right? So you can, you know, the periodic orbit does something because of the algebra sitting in the background, you can decompose it into a product of these guys, maybe inverses here, inverses here. So this particularly nice correspondence between the algebra and the um, Thurston theory here, and this is a theorem due to Matsuoka, is that, the braid type of a uh, three point invariant set is pseudo nasa if and only if it's represented by a word in just sigma one and sigma two inverse and not their inverses with their each occurring at least at least once, not once. Okay. So here's a quick application that's um, because it corresponds to a famous one-dimensional theorem. So if you have a pseudo Nossoff period three, which you can compute from this very easily, then the ambient map has periodic orbits of all periods. All right, so you all know period three implies chaos. So this is the two-dimensional version. If you have a period three, it's not finite order, then you have, then for your given map, whatever it is, if you have a period three, you have periodic orbits of all periods. So how do you prove this given our current technology? Well, it turns out with period threes, you can compute the Markov partition. And in this particular case, the Markov partition looks like the same as a one dimensional Markov partition. And then you just use the one dimensional theory. Okay, so these are again, examples of various theorems. Um, there's a partial order on braid types, which I think I will um, not talk about because it takes a while and I want to get on to rotation sets. 
Um, and maybe could we break now? Is it okay? Since this is logical place. So um, 10 minutes, 15, 10, 10 minutes. Okay. So you So we have a strategy now, and I wanna show you one way in which this strategy is implemented, and that's for rotation sets on surfaces. So why well, have to develop a whole theory of what a rotation vector is on a surface, but the strategy will be the same. We'll look at the rotation set of a pseudo NASOP. We'll take a periodic orbit, see what the rotation set of the pseudo Nasov representative on its complement is and say, ah, that has to be present in the original map, which has that orbit. All right, same strategy. It's just now, instead of talking about the entropy or periodic orbits, we're talking about the rotation set. So just to remind you, the classical rotation set, I have a degree one map of the circle of a circle, you lift to the universal cover, this will be important, you lift to a cover, and you compute the displacement in the cover, right? So you asymptotic average displacement, you go off to infinity linearly at most, and so you average it out, and you get maybe a number. If this is not injective, this maybe not doesn't exist, but you just focus on where it exists. So now we want to generalize this. So in general, you can do this with any manifold or a finite CW complex. But now just think of X as a surface of higher genus or the annulus or the punctured disk or something like that. All right, so what do we need to compute a rotation set? Well, first you have to make a choice. Where are you going to be measuring things, the rates? So because you're going to be doing averaging, you want a vector space. So we're going to do everything in homology. All right. So what we need then is we need a covering space that tells us about homology. Remember, we want displacement in a cover. So we want displacement in the cover that measures homology. All right. So this covering space is called the universal abelian cover. It needs to be an abelian covering space because it's measuring H1. Now, this is the kind of technical thing is that when we lift to this covering space, we want to make sure that if we have this point goes here and this point goes here, and this is X tilde, and this is another lift, say X tilde plus N, right? We want this choice to give us the same answer as this choice. Right, so if we move our point by the deck transformation, we want to get the same displacement. All right, so it turns out that if you figure out what this means algebraically, it means that all your lifts must commute with all deck transformations. And then you can check this on homology, but I'm not going to go into that. So there's some condition on you know, what covering spaces you can use and what ways you can measure things. Um, Another ingredient, um, well, okay, so let me, let me skip this one. So this is just the algebra that I told you you can work, work about. All right, so what are the standard ways to think about rotation sets on manifolds? All right, so this is just the algebraic topology stuff, which I'm going to suppress. So let's assume you're homotopic to the identity, all right, and you're on a manifold. So you choose the covering space to be the universal abelian cover. All right, so you maybe know what this is, but you take the universal cover and you mod out by the action of the commutator subgroup, or it's just you know, the cover you build where the deck transformations are exactly, well, you have Z to the B, B where, where B is the rank of H1. All right, so you have with a genus, G surface, you have two G directions to measure homology in. You measure rates around here, rates around here, rates around here, but you want to cut the thing open. I'll show you some pictures. Cut the thing open so you have asymptotic displacements in the cover. All right, so the simplest case is that it's isotopic to the identity. Now, you can jack things up a little bit because it depends just on homology. You can, in fact, 
computer rotation set if you're isotopic to not isotopic to the identity, but you act as the identity on homology. So for example, the, these maps of the uh, wedge of two circles, they're highly non-trivial homotopically, but they're, they act like the identity on homology. So this is just a good example that you can compute a rotation set in this case, despite the fact that it's not homotopic to the identity. So these are just examples here. Um, here's another example that's studied sometimes that you're isotopic to a shear. So these are like a standard type map on, on the torus. In this case, you have two directions, but you can only compute a rotation set in one direction. Right, so there's a cover, you lift, you lift, when you have the torus, you cut it open in one direction and un unwrap it. So the other direct, the rotation set is defined going one direction around the torus, but not the other. So you'd have to sit and think about that. And this is the algebra that's underlying it, but let's just focus on the fact that if you're homotopic to a shear, there's one direction that you can compute a rotation set in. Right, so you need the proper covering space, and then you need a way to measure displacement in that covering space. Okay, so in certain cases, this is easy. So if you start with a torus, then the universal cover is the universal abelian cover, it's Rn, and you're just computing displacements as in this picture in Rn. All right, so that's the simple case. I have the annulus is also much studied. You use this cover and you just measure displacement in this direction. So beta, the thing you're measuring displacement with is just projection here. Um, I talked about this example already. If you're homotopic to a sphere, to a shear, then you can only have one direction to compute the rotation set. So you have just the motion up the cylinder when you lift it. So here's a more interesting example. So this is now, this remember our period three example keeps coming up because it's simplest to work with. Then we wanna find a covering space, which gives us now the asymptotic linking number around these points. All right, so we don't, we want, that's the, remember these three points are permuted usually, it's a periodic orbit. So we want a way to measure how the dynamics is wrapping around these three points, right? So it's, it's still a rotation set, but now you might call it a linking set. All right, so how are we gonna do this? So I wanted to do a slightly more concrete example here. So you can think of these things concretely by cutting this the space. So first you cut it along these three lines. All right, so these three lines, if you know anything about covering space, correspond, intersection with them is, is a cohomology class. All right, but you cut, you cut open along them, and then you bed one up and you bend one down, okay? So here's the picture you get when you do that. So here, forget about this, this is coming later. So here, if you look at it, if you cut it off here, you cut it off here, you see you have this picture. All right, so, the point here is we've built this thing so that if an orbit is moving up, it's saying precisely that an orbit is rotating around these holes. All right, so because crossing a cut line here tells you about rotation and crossing a cut line, the cut lines are here, are moving you up in this cover. All right, so there's one deck transformation this is an abelian cover called a Z cover because the vector transformation is just Z. And you lift to this guy and then compute asymptotic displacements in this direction. All right, so there's a bunch of jazz here that I'm not gonna focus on here. I wanna, I should have censored this, but here's what we do now. So now it should be obvious what we're gonna do. We have a direction to measure uh, asymptotic displacements. So we take the limit of, for example, in this picture, the displacement after n iterates. We take the 
observable in this case back here, just the height. We take the observable at the nth iterate, subtract it from the observable at the initial point and divide by n. All right, so you're computing in this picture an asymptotic rate vertically. All right, it looks just like a, un, you know, like the circle, but now the manifold itself is complicated. All right, so of course the limit may not exist, but um, we'll see in a second standard co comment about Birkhoff's theorem. Um, the rotation set is the collection of these guys. Um, and now, all right, so we get this rotation set. And now, as I commented already, how are we going to implement our strategy, our procedure for using isotopy stability of dynamics? All right, so here's the strategy, as I said this already. We compute the rotation set of a pseudo Nasov map. It could be pseudo Nasov relative to a finite set. It could be pseudo Nasov and act like the identity, or it could be going back to one of our wedge examples. It could be the one that acts like uh, the identity. And then we say, ah, isotopy stability due to Handel we get that anything isotopic can only have a bigger rotation set, all right? So once we compute the rotation set of a pseudo Nasov representative, we get a, a lower bound on the rotation set of our original map, all right? Same strategy, but now focusing on the rotation set as the dynamical thing you're computing. All right, so I'm going to uh, show you some examples. So there's a number of theorems which implement this strategy. And the starting point here is we have to compute the rotation set for the pseudo Nasov representative, okay? So we need to understand how to do this. And this goes back to David Fried, his thesis, in fact. Um, and I'm gonna show you an example how to do this and then when you know, again, I should emphasize, you know the pseudo Nasov, then you know for any map which has isotopic to that, even relative to a finite set. All right, so here's our example that we, uh, our third one here. So this is the guy, because it acts like the identity, then this guy is well defined. So acting like the identity, you feed it through the algebraic topology tells you that if you just, if you have a different lift of the point, you get the same displacement. Okay, so what's the universal abelian cover here? Well, it's just the edges of the infinite checkerboard, right? And deck transformations are just the usual z squared acting on the plane. And now we're going to remember that we have Markov boxes, which are A and B. So remember, A goes around itself um, A times, oh, well, well, we have inverses here, so they reverse like that. So we look at the action on the Markov boxes in the covering space, all right? So A, so remember, here's our universal abelian cover. A goes to A, A, B, A inverse, B inverse. You can't see it, but it's up there. And B goes to B, well, B goes, sorry, to B inverse, a inverse, uh, B, B, A. So we're ignoring the, there's a more sophisticated thing to put the orientation in, but we don't need that because we're computing rotation sets. All right, so this in the covering space, this is the action on Markov boxes. All right, so now we want to record, just like you write a transition matrix, we want to feed more information into the transition matrix, keep track of where the Markov boxes go in the cover, right? You can do this in any covering space, but we're using the universal abelian cover because it has this nice property and we're interested in rotation sets. Okay, so what's the story here? So A, if we're looking, for example, to A and A transitions, A goes to A, a goes, oh, A plus the identity, if you like. A goes to A plus one zero. A goes to A plus one one. So it's a little awkward putting these guys in. And it's a little easier to label the deck transformations, which a pair of variables. 
and let's call T the one going across, R the one going up. And so A goes to itself with three transitions, one, T, and TR. All right, so we do this with each box. So we only got two boxes and two things to convert. And we get an arrow diagram, but now it's labeled. So I've labeled all the transitions in the cover in terms of the deck transformations, how the Markov boxes move in the cover, I've labeled them in the transition diagram. Okay, now, how do we use this to compute the rotation set? Now we need another observation, which has again been known a lot. I mean, it's not deep, it goes back to David Fried. Um, that to understand an infinite path in an arrow diagram, it suffices to look at the minimal loops. In other words, ones that hit each vertex, this is wrong. It should be that hit each path, each arrow one. So that shouldn't be vertex. If we were doing a vertex shift, it would be the vertex. So we just care about, you know, if we know about all the fixed ones, and the period two ones. So all there are, there's fixed, 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 there's period twos. Those are the only minimal loops. And any other path, we get by repeating those, concatenating those more precisely, all right? So concatenation corresponds very simply to how the rotation sets. You know, we do this and this period, we do this and this period, and so we put them together. So you can figure out directly all the rotation vectors by understanding the rotation vectors of the minimal loops, all right? In fact, what we'll find and what the theorem says is that the extreme points of the rotation sets correspond to minimal loops because every other orbit corresponds to a convex combination of the extreme points. And that'll turn out to correspond to a concatenation of paths in the diagram. So the upshot of this is that you compute the rotation set from a Markov partition it suffices to know the transitions corresponding to minimal loops. All right, so you just do that, right? You look there and you write it down. There's only period ones and period twos. You see what they are corresponding to the rotation vectors. Just do the computation. Here they are, you draw a picture and the fixed points are the extreme points. It could be the period twos, but in this case, the period twos are not extreme points. All right, so we compute this rotation set. So this is our rotation set of E3. And now the strategy here and the point of all this is not just to get this, but if we homotope V3, then we don't lose this rotation set, all right? So anything in the homotopy class has at least this rotation set. All right, so I think I have more examples here. So I'll do these fairly quickly. So here's a period five orbit on the annulus period, it's rotation number two fifth. Here's a Markov partition. We take its image. Um, here we lift it to, we get a better picture in the cover. We um, draw the transition diagram labeled here, corresponds to a matrix. Now, anyway, you can write it as the matrix and then iterate the matrix. Um, Compute the minimal loops and you find the rotation. But now it's just an interval because there's just one direction we're measuring around or horizontal here. We have this guy, one third, one half. Um, now I want to do a period three. So this is what's happening in the fluid experiment. And I want to see. The period three, I want to compute its linking number, right? So its linking rotation set will be an interval, which is telling me how quickly or slowly I'm moving up this thing, which is telling me how quickly or slowly I'm rotating around this orbit under this map. Okay, so here's a Markov partition. The reason we're choosing this, well, because it covers itself nicely, and it's going to be connected to the pseudo Nassau that's still sitting in the background. Turns out this is basically the Markov partition of the pseudo-Anasov. The same is the case here. 
Okay, so let's see if we can compute what happens to these Markov boxes. So this guy is kind of clumsy to put in the cover. So it's possible. So there's another trick. And since we're measuring the linking number around this orbit, we can draw a picture and see that this box, when it goes to itself, crosses this once. So this is box B prime. It goes to itself. It's T inverse because it's crossing in this direction. All right, so you look at the picture and you once again get it, get a transition diagram, labeled diagram, uh, arrow diagram with the deck transformations uh, or the linking transformation, the linking number of the various translate transformations. Here it is, you compute it and you find the linking set is minus one, one. So because it's pseudo Nossoff, every, I should say, Again, there's more theory in the background, but every point in here is represented. Rationals are represented by periodic points. Um, and there is a compact invariant set for every rotation. There's a compact invariant set and therefore an invariant measure corresponding to every point in here, except maybe the endpoints. So there's a lot more information in that thing than just seems from its endpoints. All right, so these were just a bunch of examples of explicit computations. Now here's, to, I, I did a lot of these examples just to kind of fun and they don't take very long. So now I'm gonna go both linking around the period five orbit and around the annulus. So now we're gonna have a linking rotation number. And again, it's all tells us what the map is doing both around this direction and around the holes. So now the covering space is this. We have a deck transformation corresponding to the annulus. We have a linking transformation corresponding to going around the, peri the periodic orbit. I won't go through the details. We get the minimal loops. There are various periods. That's the rotation set. Okay. So what, is, what do these examples have to do with our paradigm is that the axiom A picture I drew, so those Markov partitions corresponded to an axiom A map, they're basically the same Markov partition as the Sudwanasov map. So I'm not going to prove that to you, but for people who know the theory, that's quite easy to do. All right, so the upshot of this is that the isotopy map, real the orbit, has at least the computed rotation set. All right, so. This is the uh, this is a little clumsy for some reason. I did this for crack on. But so again, the, I keep saying this. Hope, hopefully, I don't have to say it anymore. But if you have a map of the annulus and you say, aha, this map of the annulus is the same braid type of this example we've studied. All right. So it may be there, may not be there. You compute it numerically, however. And then you immediately get for your map. By running this theorem, isotopy class in the complement, Hamdel, et cetera, you get that your rotation set, your linking rotation set is at least this big. Okay, so that's some, this is just stating the theorem. Um, I'm just being a little redundant here, is that if you're pi one hyperbolic and you have dense periodic orbits, so this just means you can run Hamdel's theorem. So for example, set, Pseudonasov or our map V3, you pick some covering space, then the rotation set can only get bigger under homotopy. All right, so those are that's the story. This is the paradigm. I, I've said this before. The smallest rotation set is the uh, Pseudonasov or the V3 or the other minimal model. All right, so I said that example already. All right, so now. We're going to use the language of braid types, which is a little more elegant, to talk about rotation set. So as with the entropy, we can define the rotation set of a braid type. So the rotation set of a braid type is just the rotation set of the pseudo Nossoff representative. All right, so why is that well defined? Well, what does it mean to be the braid type? We're allowing isotopy classes on the comp com complement and we're allowing conjugacy, but both of those don't 
you know, the, the Thurston representative is always the same under those, rep, those actions. All right, so we have a well-defined object corresponding to an isotopy class on a complement of a finite set. We have a rotation set, if you know, whatever context we're in, the annulus, the disc, the three holes or whatever. Okay, so now we're gonna state theorems about rotation sets, but we're gonna use this language of braid types. All right, so this is the implementation of what I said before. If you have a braid type, uh, and it's contained in the map F, then the rotation set of F is bigger than the rotation set of the braid type, or not smaller. Okay, so that's the story here. And now we're gonna have some results. All right, using this these, these, these tools to get more general theorems instead of specific examples. Okay, so I, I say this so many times, I must have, been asleep or something. Same story here. I've said this before. And there's lots of literature on this. So I'm going to just tell you some theorems that I know about because I've proved them. Okay. Okay. So here's the first theorem. All right. So this has to do with linking number in period three. All right. So remember, we know period three orbits in the disk. What do we know about them? That they're pseudo Nossoff, uh, if and only if they have a braid word in these two generators and not their inverse with each occurring once. All right, so whenever we have a period three pseudo Nossoff, we get a nice representative in terms of these words. All right, then the theorem is that the rotation interval of this braid type is AB, where A is the number of sigma ones and B is the number of sigma twos. Okay, so just to beat it to death, you have, a, you have a map of the disk, you find a period three, you compute how it's um, written in terms of these periods, then you know that your given map has orbits that are wrapping around the periodic orbit with at least this linking interval. All right, so that's one thing, and the way you prove it is, um, as you would, as you should expect now, you compute the Markov partition, see the action on the Markov partition, and then you see it's, this is exactly your rotation set. So it's a, just a generalization of the example I showed you. All right, so here's another theorem that needs a little number theory. So remember what the Fairy interval is. Um, I think I forgot something here. You take the maximum of A over B, uh, less than P over Q with B less than Q, and you take the minimum of things bigger than P over Q. So it's the Fairy interval um, of, of, of a rational of these two numbers. It has a lot of pro special properties. P over Q is the Fairy sum. These guys have this formula like determinant one. So if you know the Fairy diagram, these are the Fairy parents and the Fairy diagram. Um, so, for example, two fifths, the ferry interval is one third, one half. Okay, so here's the theorem that if you have a uh, PQ braid type on the annulus and it's pseudo Nossoff, then the rotation set at least contains the ferry interval. All right, so if you have a two fifths orbit on the annulus that um, is pseudo Nossoff type, then its rotation set is at least this, all right? The rotation set of the map, which has that braid type is at least that, all right? So this is the conclusion here, is that if beta is a braid type of F, then the ferry interval is in your rotation set. Okay, um, another theorem along the same line, Remember alpha P over Q is the braid type on the annulus but periodic orbit arising by rigid rotation by P over Q. Then the theorem is that if you have any point with rotation number P over Q, then you have the simplest one, all right? So this is the, um, there's something in the world of twist maps because the aubrey mather theorem, if you have a rational, in your rotation set, then you have what's called a Birkhoff periodic orbit, 
Perkoff or periodic orbit is the one that's ordered around the annulus in the proper way. All right, so it's a topological version of it. If you have anything with rotation number P over Q, you have the simplest periodic orbit. All right, and again, it follows from the whole theory. You know, you look at the pseudo Nossoff representative, you show the pseudo Nossoff representative has to have this guy, which involves, you know, fairly detailed argument, and then you pull it back to your arbitrary hat. Okay, so here's another theorem along the same lines in the annulus. So here's a, a special family. So sometimes one studies special families. Um, so let's look at a very special periodic orbit. So this periodic orbit is you do rigid rotation by P over Q, and then you do a Dane twist, you flip all the way around. So you still have P over Q, but now you forced it not to be the simplest one. Okay, so the result in this case is that um, the rotation set of uh, this guy is exactly the fair unit. Remember the theorem before was that it should contain the Fairy interval, but this is exactly the Fairy interval. All right, so this guy goes back to the partial order on brain types. And let me just explain it in words. So if you have, so here are a pair of these particular brain types, all right? And you wanna know if you always have this one, do you always have this one? All right, so if any map has this braid type, does it have this braid type, All right? So that's the partial order. Well, for this particular family, this guy always forces this one, if and only if it's very interval is bigger, all right? Now, and this is also a case where you get explicit estimates on the size of the, the entropy. So for this, pseudo, this particular family, you can compute the Markov partition, from that, you get the largest eigenvalue, which gives you, well, then you can compute the characteristic polynomial. It depends on the um, fairy parents. So this is P over Q. The fairy parents are R over S, R prime over S prime. So it's these denominators which determine the entropy of this particular braid type. So it's the largest root of this guy. This is just a coarse topology estimate. All right, so again, we implement the strategy in this particular case. This is simple enough, we can compute a Markov partition. And once we have that, we can pull out all sorts of information. All right, so the two-fifths example that I showed you before is of this class. Okay, so let's go back to the torus now, and I'll tell you about Libra and Mackay's theorem, which as I said, is sitting at was kind of a foundational result in rotation sets in the torus. So let's say we have a map on the torus isotopic to the identity. All right. So in this case, we compute the rotation vectors in the torus. Now the rotation set's going to be in sitting in the plane. And now in that rotation set, so I talked about this before, but now let me draw a picture. So in that rotation set, you have three nonlinear points represented. All right, so that means you have periodic orbits of these three periods. So you're sitting down in the annulus, sorry, in the torus, and you have the periodic points. And then you implement the strategy, you pull out those points, all right? And then, as I mentioned, when you pull out those points, you get a pseudo Nossoff map, right? You pull out those points, you get a pseudo Nossoff class, all right? And then you have to understand that pseudo Nossoff class. Okay, so, what they do is they say it's pseudo Nossoff, they understand that pseudo Nossoff class. And in particular, you get a bunch of conclusions about your original map. All right, so what are those conclusions? Well, the, it implies if you have three such points, then you have positive topological entropy. 
All right. Now, sitting in the background here is the theorem of uh, Franks that if you have a rotation set with interior and you pick any rational points, then they're represented by periodic points. All right. So you put these pieces together and you see that if you have a homeomorphism of the torus and its rotation set has interior, then you have positive topological entropy. Okay, so that's first conclusion. Second is more detailed. Um, it's more detailed coming from the semi-conjugacy, from the isotopy stability. So you go back and you understand the pseudo Anosov representative here. And in particular, you see from the symbolic dynamics of this guy, you see that for every point in here, you get a compact invariant set, right? So this is for the Sibonasov. For every point, so alpha, is, alpha vector is contained in this triangle, there exists a compact invariant set X alpha. I'm just showing you in detail, there exists a rotation set of X alpha is exactly alpha, right? So by using the Markov partition, the symbolic dynamics, you check that for every point in here, you have a compact invariant set with exactly that rotation number. And therefore you have an ergodic measure whose rotation set of the measure, which is just the integral of the displacement against the measure is exactly alpha. So, and this again exists for the pseudo Nossoff representative, and therefore it exists by Handel's theorem for your original map, which had these three points. All right. So, again, this is in the world of, right? So, in the world of what's sitting in the background here, just for some context, is when you're studying rotation sets. What you'd like to know is how much information the rotation set gives you about the dynamics. You know, if I hand you, you know, the whole point of the rotation set is to develop a concrete, simpler description of the dynamics. And so you'd like to know how much information that simplest, that simpler description is giving you. So what this theorem tells you is it's a lot of information. It's telling you if you have this rotation set, then for points in the rotation set, then you have compact invariant sets with that rotation number, et cetera. So it's kind of the converse. You compute the rotation set, but sometimes you're just given the rotation set and it gives you a lot of data. Now, this involved a lot of work, you know, understanding the Markov partition, understanding the uh, dynamics and behavior of observables over Markov partitions and all the Markov processes. A um, little simpler thing to a quapish is just the size of this triangle can give you some estimate of topological length. Okay, so one last topic um, is to understand a little more about pseudo Nossoff rotation sets. May I? Yes, I sure. Yes. started proving the convexity of rotation Yes. There were general questions. I remember whether every convex set can be, can be achieved. Yes. With the true or not, it's still open. Still open. Still open. Still open. So it's known. So that's another the, the story, part of the story. <laughs> no, it, no, so, well, right. So I didn't mention, so. Here. So you, yeah, so, so rotation sets on the torus started at University of Warsaw with Miserevich. Was he, he was professor there in Kwapish. He also in Barcelona. And, and Zimanian. So some of these results here, I should have mentioned all this, but there's a whole, I, I eliminated these slides, but there's a whole theory about subships of finite type. And the corresponding things are average values of observables on subships of finite type. So this is observed, the rotation is a special case 
when you have a Markov partition of the average values of observables on a subshift of finite type. And that's Zimanian, who also was here. Zimanian, she proved the fundamental theorem about when I said that these points for the pseudo null self map it was her that proved that there's a compact invariant set for each of these. So anyway, there's many open questions about rotation sets still, but okay. So here's the last thing um, is what's the fundamental property of a pseudo Nossoff representative and its rotation set. Okay, so here, let me describe this result informally and then see what I want to say about the proof. Let's look at a let's look at a homeomorphism of the two torus. And let's say we have a finite invariant set here. Let's call this guy that. And this finite invariant set called P. And F rel P. All right, so what's the, if you're a topologist, what's the first question you'd have about this? Well, the first question I would ask is how do the dynamics explore homology, right? So you have four different loops to go around, four different directions. And if you had a map that you want to call topologically chaotic or H1 transitive or something, You'd like to say that the map, the orbits, explore all the directions of homology. All right. So, what does it mean to explore all the directions of homology? Well, you think about what that means in terms of the rotation set. The rotation set, remember, is the four directions, how much motion there is in four directions. So you explore all of homology exactly when your rotation set is four dimensional, right? So you can go in any direction in homology, right? If you were sitting in some subspace of lower dimension, you wouldn't go in that direction. So you wouldn't be exploring that dimension in homology. Okay, so the theorem here is that in this case, if you're pseudo nasa relative to a finite set, then your rotation set is top dimensional. In this case, the rotation set of our graph B is four dimensional. All right, so we explore, because we have a pseudo Nossoff orbit, it forces the original map to explore all of homology. Okay, so here's the statement of the theorem. Now, if you have a map that's relatively pseudo Nossoff with its cover as deck ZK, so in this case, the covering space is four dimensional, then the rotation set is K dimensional. All right, so here's the example. I already did this example for G equals uh, one, two. Um, <clears throat> equals two, sorry, e equals two. So we get a polygon of proper dimensions. All right, so let me have just five minutes. I haven't really spent much time on proof. So let me just say a little bit about this. Um, maybe, well, then, okay. So how would you prove such a thing? Well, the idea is that you don't want the rotation set to live in a finite dimensional subspace. Okay, so I think I think I'm going to just go eat lunch here. <laughs> so let me. Uh, yeah, instead of four, this is going to take more than five minutes, and it's not really that important to, to what we're doing. So let me stop. Say say have a good lunch. Uh, <clears throat>
<clears throat> Excuse me, may I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Uh, if two uh, homeomorphisms of uh, the disk have uh, same braid types of periodic points, uh, is it possible to say that they are uh, conjugate? Or is there something like this? Yeah, so I, well, the first thing I think one could simply say no, because outside of the periodic orbits, one of them could have, you know, have a disk with irrational rotations of different speeds. Okay, so you may need something like a period. So it's a good question. I don't know the answer. You, the, maybe you'd formulated a periodic orbits are dense and you knew all the um, braid types are the maps conjugate. Um, there's comparable theorems for um, linear NOSOPs where you know this, you know, the spectrum of periodic points that are conjugate. So I don't know the answer, it's a good question, but yeah, you'd formulated a periodic orbit through dense, so there's not these kind of random other irrational minimal set stuff going on. Um, but probably they have the same entropy. I think one could prove that. Um, if there's C1 uh, to alpha. But it, it seems that uh, having irrational rotation with different rotation numbers is not really a problem because if uh, uh, somehow if you want to have, uh, it, 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 is, it seems that it's not possible because you should, if you want to change the rotation number, then you should make some new periodic points. Well, let's just be in the disk, okay? We have two maps of the disk, rotation by square root of two, square root of three. Yes. They both have, yes. all right, so they both have one fixed point. So they have the same braid types and they're not conjugate. Yes, yes. Yeah, so as I say, trivial example. So you need some other hypotheses to eliminate stuff happening away from the periodic points. Yes. Okay, <laughs> Thank you.